Thank you. Yeah, good, uh, good afternoon. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for, for putting this uh, interesting workshop together. Uh, so we had a nice uh, introduction on uh, black body in op optical clocks uh, this morning already by Christian Listert. Uh, and we will hear a presentation by Tanja Milstab, also I think probably focusing on a specific optical clock system. So I try to be a little bit uh, complementary uh, in what I'm uh, telling you uh, is two aspects. Uh, one is a little bit going to the history of, uh, of the uh, black body effect on cesium clocks the primary clocks uh, for time scales and for the SI second. And, uh, and in the second part, I will speak a little bit about uh, clocks with minimal sensitivity to uh, black body effects, uh, nuclear clocks, that it was uh, uh, briefly discussed this morning already, or there was a question already about this. Uh, so the uh, the history of the of the interaction of uh, of black body radiation with atoms, um, I think is uh, is uh, started by by this investigation by Gallagher and Cook at, at Stanford in in seventy eight, um, who uh, pointed out here that atomic transitions will be uh, influenced by black body radiation both in in terms of uh, of transitions induced and also in terms of frequency shifts. So from this point, quite uh, of you quite in seminal paper, uh, they studied uh, Rydberg atoms, um, so a little bit different uh, domain than, than atomic clocks, um, but uh, it is what got people interested uh, in, in the field. Um, if we look at uh, specifics, the relevance of, of black body radiation, room temperature, black body radiation for, for clocks, I'd like to show this diagram here. Uh, we know the 300 Kelvin uh, black body spectrum uh, centered here at about uh, 10 micron. And if we talk about clocks, uh, of course, well, fortunately, the clocks do not operate in this regime, but either at higher or lower frequencies. So we, we heard this morning about the optical clocks operating in the visible uh, spectrum. So for them, the black body radiation field is largely as close to, uh, to static, it is at a, at a low frequency, and the influence is mainly via an AC stark shift uh, of the electronic uh, resonances. If you look at the microwave clocks, that is yet the atomic uh, clocks of the 1950s or so, and uh, the clocks that are still today used for, mm -hmm. for time scales mm -hmm. based on microwave transitions, mm -hmm. they are at the centimeter, uh, centimeter wavelengths uh, range gigahertz uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. So for them, mm -hmm. um, they are in lower frequency than the, than the black body spectrum. Mm -hmm. And for them, again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's AC stark shifts, but now it's just differential effect. So it is via the electron shell mm -hmm. uh, and then then one has to look carefully mm. for differential effects between the two levels that make mm. uh, that makes a clock. The interactions is still mm. uh, predominantly the electric field, the, the, uh, the Stark effect. Mm. We have heard it already this morning. Mm. Uh, one could, of course, co com for completeness consider there would be an electric interaction and a magnetic interaction mm. uh, via the Zeeman effect. But it turns out if one puts in the, mm. the uh, atomic moments, uh, that normally the electric interaction mm. is dominating. And this is true both for the optical mm. transitions that directly uh, are seen in the electronic structure mm. And it's also true for the hyperfine uh, effects. Also, the hyperfine interaction itself is predominantly magnetic. Uh, the differential effect for the shift is predominantly from the uh, from the quadratic stark interaction. And then, yeah, we have seen the the equation already. The, it can be described by a by a scalar uh, polarizability. Then there's geometrical factors and factors depending on the on the quantum numbers. And we have the uh, quadratic uh, RMS field strength. Of the, of the black body radiation field scaling uh, predominantly with t to the 4. And, uh, and then one asked what is the effect on the, on the level shift of the, uh, of the clock. And so for the, for the cesium clock, the question was asked for the first time in, in 1982 and in this paper here by, uh, by Itano, Lewis, and, uh, and Wineland at the, at the US uh, NBS uh, NIST today. And they made the calculation, they, made, they estimated the shift for the S1 half hyperfine uh, splitting, specifically, of course, for the cesium clock. So the cesium clock has the S1 half uh, ground state. And they point out that the, uh, the shift at 300 Kelvin is large enough to be significant in primary cesium atomic beam frequency standards and should be measurable. And they calculated it and uh, turned out to be on the order of the relative shift to be about 1, 1.7, 10 to the minus 14 at, at room temperature. 
these people, Dave Weinland, had worked on the primary mm. uh, cesium clocks at NIST at the time, and they knew that the, that the uh, uncertainty budget of those clocks was in the low 10 minus 14 range. So in principle, mm. uh, that's why they said it should be uh, this relevant effect and it should be, uh, and should, it should be measurable. But nevertheless, uh, it turned out to be, to be very tricky. It took uh, more than a decade <laughs> until somebody really succeeded in measuring it. Uh, and this was at, uh, this was at PDB. Mm. And the, um, the, the problem was that really the cesium machines that, that existed at the time were, of course, constructed to be robust and to, and to basically to protect the cesium atoms from changes of the, mm. of the environmental conditions. So they were operated at room temperature, but it would be very difficult to change the temperature mm. uh, either cooling or, or heating the apparatus. And PTB happened to have uh, built an, an experimental mm -hmm. uh, machine that allowed to, uh, to, to heat uh, the, uh, the interaction zone. But nevertheless, it was quite an experimental uh, challenge. And so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to show this. So by, by coincidence, mm -hmm. a part of this apparatus is, uh, mm -hmm. is showed in a, uh, on display mm -hmm. right next to my office. Uh, so it's uh, kept for historical, mm -hmm. for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. So what people did here, it's, it's a Ramsey machine. So you see the microwave mm -hmm. uh, guide uh, with the two interaction zones at the beginning and at the end. And then people installed here mm -hmm. heated tubes uh, in order to provide a controllable mm -hmm. uh, black body field on the atoms as they were flying in the uh, uh, Ramsey uh, dark zone between the two interactions. And now the experimental challenge, of course, mm. here is the microwave distribution. It has to be very phase stable and symmetric. So you don't want this temperature to change, but you want this to heat. And you want to heat it electrically, but you don't want the magnetic field to change in this region because it's a region that's sensitive for the, for the clock. So these were the experimental uh, challenges. Uh, but, but this is a result of the, of the experiment. So the, uh, the solid line here is the theoretical estimate based on the yeah. on the coefficients uh, that were uh, used in the Itano uh, theory, and then you can see the uh, the experimental c uh, points with some with some scatter, but uh, but uh, confirming uh, basically the theoretical uh, prediction. And uh, now you can ask, okay, so so the effect is is at ten to the minus fourteen. Mm -hmm. Is the effect really was it relevant at the time for the clocks and for the and for the time mm -hmm. uh, keeping? Mm -hmm. Only very few clocks had been analyzed at that uh, at that uh, uh, degree of uncertainty in the time, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was also not so easy to uh, not not obvious to have two or more clocks for making comparisons. Mm -hmm. So this is a record mm -hmm. with the CS1 and CS2 clocks at PTB, and they had the mm -hmm. they are the ones that were most uh, 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 with the highest duty cycle used over these more than 20 years uh, in, in this time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can see uh, mm -hmm. it's 10 to the minus 14 scale here. You can see quite some, some scatter of the points um, in, the, uh, in the difference between the clock and the international atomic time. Um, and you, you look at this plot and you say, oh, obviously something changed, something improved over the time. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, mm -hmm. uh, nothing happened to these clocks. So they were, uh, nothing was changed. So what we see here mm -hmm. uh, on the clocks, was what we see here is changes in the uh, opportunities to compare clocks. So the international mm -hmm. uh, time transfer was, of course, mm -hmm. uh, developing. This is a time when, when GPS signals were used. And you can see it reduced the signal, mm -hmm. the, the, the scatter. Mm -hmm. Here, improved commercial cesium clocks became available, mm -hmm. contributing to the the overall stability of the international atomic time, mm. and that is the improvements we see here. Mm. And you see, yes, a 110 minus 14 mm. would be barely resolvable. Mm. Here, in, a, in about 90, uh, 90 or so, there is a there is a step, mm. but we looked again at this data. It has nothing to do with the uh, with a change in the definition. But effective, efficient, effectively, in 1997, so not so long ago, mm. um, the international committees decided that the effect should be taken into the into the definition. The definition was just the second is so and so many oscillations of the cesium atom without specifying it further and then it was added the sentence as a footnote the definition refers to a cesium atom at rest and at a temperature of uh, of zero kelvin and it means that the correction for the black body shift should be uh, should be applied uh, to the clock 
Um, I'm zero Kelvin, of course, I think it maybe one would have better said in the absence of, uh, of uh, external electric and, uh, and magnetic fields. Um, so at the time it was not, it was barely visible and it was, it was not so relevant for the, for the practical timekeeping. But since then, uh, people have improved on these measurements with cold cesium atoms. It was mainly the groups in, uh, in Paris working with cesium fountains of, of laser cooled atoms. So you hear the, you see laser cooled atoms being, being prepared and thrown up against uh, gravity and then passing a microwave cavity doing the Ramsey interaction, of course, much longer interaction time than in the beam uh, clock that I've shown you be, uh, before. And then they did two experiments. They placed uh, field plates uh, above the, the cavity so that the free-flying atoms would be exposed to a kilovolt per centimeter electric field in order to measure the static uh, Stark effect. And then they also put a, put a heated uh, a tube uh, there where the atoms would be flying uh, through, the, through a black body uh, field at higher temperature. And here you can see the results. So these were first theoretical uh, predictions, the first experimental result from PTB, and then, and then the, the, the latest measurements here with the black body field and with the Stark. So the, the Stark coefficient is the one that provided the lowest experimental uncertainty. And so overall, this, uh, this factor here in front of the uh, sensitivity of the T to the 4 term is now known with a fraction of a percent uncertainty or so to, to do this uh, correction or the for, the, uh, for the cesium clocks. So this is the state uh, of, of the art for the cesium and it is the correction that is, uh, that is applied. Now we, uh, we learned, of course, that today we have, uh, we have different clocks. We have the optical clocks and uh, uh, that provide the... Um, uh, the higher uh, reproducibility, higher accuracy, higher stability. Uh, we have uh, work here, at, this is a great laboratory at PTB where we have the cesium fountains and optical clocks right next to them. This is clocks with the, with the trapped ions, with the terbium. There is a, a poster presented here by Martin Steinl uh, on how we try to control the black body shift in, uh, in, in this type. Um, we will hear more on, on iron clocks by, from Tanja Mischdorp in the next uh, 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 talk. Uh, just very briefly, the, the, the problems here are really, uh, are really different in that we have now an, uh, some uh, material close to the to the iron we need one needs to do an, an analysis of the uh, of the temperature distribution and of the uh, and of the distribution of the radiation field and this was the first uh, uh, analysis done here at PTB with a somewhat historic type of iron trap uh, that was designed not really under the consideration of having high thermal uh, homogeneity here it was an uncertainty of about one Kelvin uh, for the temperature the effective temperature of the radiation field, one can do better by uh, selecting better suited uh, uh, materials. Um, uh, we have here a next generation of, uh, uh, of, of, of trap, and, uh, uh, and so this is work going on to obtain a, a very homogeneous radiation field at the, at the position of the iron. But um, yeah, I, we will. We, I think we will learn more about uh, about this today in the upcoming in the next lecture. But uh, so so I would like to to finish on the other aspect of uh, of asking: Are there clocks which have uh, which have much smaller or which have lower uh, sensitivity to the uh, to the black body field? And the answer is yes, there there are, and uh, there is a number of candidates. And this especially uh, interesting, maybe uh, nuclear clocks or so clocks that are based on the. Um, on the reference frequency, not in the electron shell, um, but in the nucleus. And now we, one could say that the problem is now asking about the polarizability of the, of the nuclear matter, which is in the nuclear physics a well-established field. And of course, well, intuitively, yeah, we all feel it, is, it should be much, much smaller. And in, in fact, people have, have analyzed it in the context of the thorium-229 mm. uh, transition. It is the uh, most interesting candidate for, for a nuclear optical clock. It is so uh, interesting because it is a nuclear transition with the lowest energy mm. that is known. It's about 8 uh, electron volt, 150 nanometers ultraviolet, vacuum ultraviolet uh, transition. Uh, and this is investigated uh, at PTB here in Vienna and a number of, mm. uh, of groups. Quite some work has been done already. Uh, investigating uh, uh, if this could be suitable for, for a clock. And uh, uh, the advantage of such a nuclear over an atomic clock is that one has a choice of the 
electronic environment. And so uh, this is the parameter that can be used uh, in order to tailor the properties and in order to arrive at something that has a low sensitivity and that is not easily perturbed, for example, by the quadratic Stark effect. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the, of the analysis as relevant to the, to the Stark effect. So we are driving, we are considering to drive um, a reference transition in the coupled nuclear and electronic system. So it's a hyperfine coupled system. It has quantum numbers of electronic uh, character LSJ. And then there is a nuclear spin. It changes, which is unusual here. We were changing the nuclear spin. And then, of course, the F number for the coupled uh, uh, angular momentum changes. Now, since we are mainly interested in the nuclear transition here, the, the electronic part is unchanged. And it means, so this is an important hand-waving part of the argument, mm -hmm. that everything that only couples to the electron structure should be common mode in this, in this clock. So the, 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 the shift should be the, the same in both levels. And this eliminates uh, mm -hmm. largely uh, some uh, effects that are otherwise of uh, trouble in clocks, like, uh, like the quadratic Stark shift, like collisions, uh, or like the black body effect. What remains is higher order terms or is terms that couple differentially to the, to the F quantum number. And this is in our first analysis that we did of the, of the problem. We said, well, there, there should be the F is changing. And so the, uh, the effect of the black body uh, radiation would be just be like a hyperfine Stark effect, an, an F dependent differential effect. And so in principle, it could be on the order of magnitude. It could be comparable to what is seen in the cesium transition. But of course, now not, rel not with relative to the nine gigahertz cesium frequency, but relative to the two, two uh, what is it, petahertz to the ten to the fifteen hertz of the of the of the nuclear clock, and that's why we very roughly estimated it could be maybe ten to the minus nineteen at, at room temperature. Then there was a more mm. precise, uh, more quantitative analysis by Andre Derebianco, Alex Kuzmich, uh, Corey Campbell. They analyzed what type of, uh, of states would be suitable. They proposed stretched states in the, in the coupled system in thorium-3+. Stretched state is the one where the angular momentum of the nucleus and of the electron are aligned. And, uh, and these states can be written, they are eigenstates of both the, the hyperfine coupled as well as uncoupled bases, and they can be written in a, in a way that the electronic and uh, nuclear degrees of freedom uncouple, and then they analyze that in the, for, the, for such a state, uh, the, the shift would be even smaller than we in our simple estimate, another three orders of magnitude gained. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it's, it's still not the nuclear contribution. It is still mm -hmm. uh, electronic contribution. So it's, it's minor ch uh, small changes to the electronic environment, to the, to the electronic uh, charge density at the nucleus mm -hmm. that produces uh, this effect. The effect of the nuclear polariz polarization would be still would be still smaller. So, um, yeah, a system where uh, one would, would uh, an interesting uh, and precise clock where one probably would not have to worry about black body radiation any uh, anymore just to give this this outline um, for one final slide I'd like to switch topics briefly for for one minute mm. uh, it didn't and it is related to uh, to black body uh, radiation in terms of radiation pressure and uh, like what we heard from Helmut which this morning about uh, uh, radiation effects uh, um, I th I've spoken about clocks. Clocks is, of course, also related to time transfer. Time transfer, precise time transfer, is via satellites. And it is so precise or so sensitive that the effect of, of radiation pressure on the GPS satellites is relevant for, for geodesy and for time transfer. So people notice, this is work here from Technical University Munich and University Bern, People noticed GPS satellite orbits available from ISS show a consistent radial bias of several centimeters and a particular pattern in the, in the uh, 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 ephemeris uh, residuals, which are suggested to be related to radiation pressure mismodeling. Of course, uh, radiation pressure from the sun had been taken into account. Mm -hmm. But what people point out here, a potential solution to this discrepancy is the inclusion of Earth's radiation pressure uh, modeling in the orbit uh, determination uh, pr process, and they included it, and they uh, find, found an improvement of the mm -hmm. of the agreement. So we see, mm -hmm. again, related to measurements with, with clocks, the, the black body radiation of uh, of Earth on the satellite 20,000 kilometers away is. Uh, is detectable and is and is relevant in this field. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah, a nice uh, a nice topic also maybe to be discussed in this context. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, with this I'd like to uh, to close and thank you for your attention. Mm.